Some of the kings and queens of England were known for their barbarism and brutal side. Kings such as Henry VIII and Bloody Mary were known for their executions, and some of the monarchs even plunged their country into civil war. In the last video we looked at some of the earlier kings of England who succumbed to brutal deaths and demises, but today we're going to pick up where we left off. The Tudor period was known as a time of much execution and brutality. However, let's begin by having a look at the Tudor monarchs and how they died, and then make our way to wars and more modern times. Welcome to part two of the painful deaths of the kings and queens of England, and as always, to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Henry VIII is mostly associated today for having six wives, but during his life he did face a number of serious bouts of illness and disease. When he was 23, he contracted smallpox, a deadly disease which was incredibly serious. However, he managed to recover over time, and then at the age of 30, he contracted malaria, which also made him sick for a while. It was three years later that one of the most worrying parts of Henry VIII's life came, when he was involved in a famous and hard-hitting jousting accident that caused him great discomfort and pain throughout the rest of his life. It's believed by some historians that this accident changed the king completely, and that his former self as a positive and happy king transformed into a depressed, short-tempered and bitter one. During a jousting match with the Duke of Suffolk, Henry was hit hard above his right eye by a lance, forcing him off his horse and onto the floor. After this he suffered badly with migraines, and at the age of 45 he was involved in yet another serious jousting accident. He fell from his horse, and after this was trapped by the animal, and was squashed by the horse and also the weight of his armour. This particular incident left him unconscious for at least two hours, and many were very worried. When he finally came around, it was said later that the king had changed even further. It's believed that this caused his mood swings, and that he possibly on the tilt yard suffered from a severe traumatic brain injury. Today he would have been diagnosed with this, but following this the king's health declined further. In his final years, Henry began to shun exercise, and he also began to overeat to a huge extent that caused his infamous weight gain. It's considered that he may also have had diabetes and high blood pressure. The king also possibly had varicose ulcers, and the ulcers in his legs would force him to give up sport and exercise, and in his final days servants had to carry him around on a chair as he suffered with movement so much. Obesity also quickened his death, with his overeating a major cause of him dying at the age of 55. Henry VIII passed away on the 28th of January 1547 at the Palace of Whitehall. On the day before his passing, he saw his confessor and priest and was given Holy Communion. Those people who attended on the king and visited him knew that death would soon be on the horizon for the monarch and the royal doctors knowing his feared reputation refused to tell this to Henry. Telling the king he was about to die was treason and predicting that he would die also was treason meaning that in one last act of brutality from his deathbed, the king could possibly have sentenced even one of his doctors to their deaths. They knew about his reputation, and refused to be honest with the king of England. It was a gentleman of the privy chamber, and a well-liked attendant of the king, Sir Anthony Denny, who was left to tell the king of his impending fate. On the 27th of January, a day before his death, he told the king that, in man's judgment, you are not like to live and that the king should remember his sins as every good Christian man should do. Henry seemingly accepted his fate, and said, The mercy of Christ is able to pardon me of all my sins, yes, so they be greater than they be. Whilst on his deathbed it's thought that Henry had the realisation that he had committed a number of great sins during his lifetime. He was a man who had ordered the executions of some of his closest friends, and even two of his own wives. Anne Boleyn, for example, today, is seen as a victim of the barbaric king and his close advisor and friend Thomas Cromwell. Because of Henry's frustration at Anne's inability to give him a son that he greatly wanted, his attention switched to another woman, Jane Seymour. But Henry needed a way out of his marriage, and he ordered Cromwell to find him one, and Cromwell orchestrated an intricate web of lies that placed the queen accused of treason, incest and adultery. And with this scheming, the king and Cromwell had in a sense an innocent woman's head struck from her body, 
having Anne Boleyn executed. The execution of Anne Boleyn was just one of many sins the brutal king had committed, and there was a long line of them. The huge scores of those executed within his kingdom, placed around 3% of the total population, executed during Henry's reign, which is a colossal amount, showing the true scale of his bloody reign. He had ordered his last high-profile execution just a week earlier, having Henry Howard, the Earl of Surrey, killed for treason. On his deathbed, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer was summoned to hear the king's last wishes and to pray for him. His close friend, Anthony Denny, was ordered to get Cranmer to be with him, and Henry then went into a deep sleep. Cranmer was sent and it took him hours to be by the king's side due to the treacherous and icy conditions, and he arrived around midnight on the 28th of January. He then went to the king's bedside, but Henry was in his final hours of life, and wasn't talking, and was struggling to stay conscious. The final moments of Henry VIII's life had been stated as, at the end there was no master and servant, no prince and churchman, just a priest preparing a departing soul for eternity. Cranmer begged Henry to give him a sign that he trusted Christ for salvation, and in response he felt a grip of his hand tighten slightly. It was an evangelical departure, no anointing, no reading of Latin prayers, just a simple acknowledgement of the all-sufficient atoning work of Christ. Cranmer would be glad of that. Around 2am the king passed away. His exact cause of death isn't completely clear, and it's believed that it could have been a pulmonary embolism or renal and liver failure that killed him. The history books have been written stating that the king did die from natural causes. For two days after his death, his body lay in a chamber undisturbed, and his death was kept a secret, even to his household staff, who were still preparing meals to be brought to his chamber for two days. On the morning of the 31st of January 1547, the Lord Chancellor announced the king's death to Parliament in tears, and then Henry's son Edward was proclaimed King Edward VI, and was taken to the Tower of London to await his coronation. Over the next few days, Henry's body was embalmed and encased in lead, and was surrounded by burning tapers, as it laid in state, inside the presence chamber at Whitehall. It was then moved to the chapel, and across the country the bells of churches tolled in memory for their dead king. On the 14th of February 1547, Henry VIII's body was taken from Whitehall to Windsor Castle. The coffin was rather large, and it was covered in blue velvet and cloth of gold, and was laid down on a chariot. This was drawn by black horses, who took it along the roads that had been prepared for the procession of the king's final journey. On the coffin was a wax effigy of the king, and on top was a crown and a nightcap of black satin filled with precious stones. The procession stopped overnight at Sion Abbey, before the next day heading to Windsor. It was said here that the remains of the king exploded, but then the journey to Windsor continued the next day. It took 16 strong yeomen of the guard to carry Henry's coffin into the church, and to lower it into the vault of the choir of St George's Chapel, with the king laid to rest next to Jane Seymour, his third wife and mother to Edward VI. Following the funeral ceremony, the chief officers of the household broke their white staves of office, and threw them into the vault after the coffin, showing that their role serving their master had come to an end. It was planned for Henry to be buried in a huge Renaissance coffin that he had taken from Cardinal Wolsey following his death in Leicester, but the work was not completed. His sarcophagus does survive, but today it's the base of Lord Nelson's tomb in the crypt of St Paul's Cathedral. Henry VIII lies today under a simple and low-key 19th century black marble floor slab that reads, In a vault beneath this marble slab are deposited the remains of Jane Seymour, Queen of King Henry VIII, 1537, and King Henry VIII, 1547. He is interred in the same vault as Charles I's remains, the king who was beheaded following the English Civil War, and also one of Queen Anne's children, who died in infancy. King Henry VIII is considered to have been one of the most notorious monarchs in history, with his bloodthirsty temper and brutal outbursts of anger that resulted in bloody acts but his death was met with relative peace and quiet, tended to by only a few close people and the Archbishop of Canterbury. His death did not echo the turbulent nature of his reign, for example the political changes, marriages and religious reforms he brought to the country. He was a king whose life was compelling, 
and today he's become a legendary figure of English history. At around 2am on the 12th of October 1537, inside one of the rooms of Hampton Court Palace, Jane Seymour, the third wife of Henry VIII, gave birth to a healthy son that was described as the most beautiful boy that ever was seen. This was the moment King Henry VIII had been waiting for. Over 20 years of disappointment had given him in the eyes a legitimate male heir to continue the Tudor dynasty. The king, overjoyed, rode to Hampton Court to meet his son, and across the country there were huge celebrations. Three days later inside the chapel of Hampton Court, the christening for the young boy took place, and the child was christened Edward. However, the boy that Henry wished for so much would reign for only six and a half years, and it would be his shunned half-sister Elizabeth who would become the greatest Tudor monarch of all. Edward spent the early years of his life inside of Hampton Court, but there was great upset following his birth after his mother Jane Seymour passed away. This caused the king to be very distraught, as it's believed Jane passed away from postnatal complications. He was kept at Hampton Court, as it was believed the air was cleaner outside of the centre of London, and he was noted to have been a rather happy and healthy child. His governess wrote, in March 1539, with Edward around 18 months old, that my Lord Prince is in good health and merry. Would to God the King and your Lordship had seen him last night. The minstrels played, and his grace danced and played so wantonly that he could not stand still. He was raised amongst women, however as he reached his sixth birthday things changed, as the Tudors believed this was the age when a child became an adult. Because of this, Henry VIII ordered that his son's household and apartments should be changed so that they were exactly the same as his, and he ordered huge Flemish tapestries to adorn the walls. Edward's childhood was spent having the finest humanist education in a well-protected environment, and his health was monitored very heavily by the royal doctors who checked up on him. They were very worried about anything that could go wrong, and if Edward did not eat something, it would be noted down. Edward was given a rather rich diet, and it was said that in October 1541, that the prince was handsome and well-fed, and also was very tall for his age. It was also said that his posture was a little off, saying his right shoulder was lower than his left, leading to the fact that the young prince may have had scoliosis of the spine. This condition was in the family, as his maternal uncle Edward Seymour did suffer from this. In the very same month, Edward became ill, and suffered with a fever and illness today that would be referred to as malaria. Edward was incredibly sick, and it looked like he was going to die, and this caused great upset to King Henry VIII. He sent his own royal doctor to see Edward, and he visited the prince regularly, and gave him soups and broths and no meat. He was kept on a boring diet of food, and because of this, Edward became annoyed, as he did not have the food he was accustomed to. He even called the doctor a fool, and questioned his skills, but this feistiness was a sign that he was recovering. After ten days of being gravely ill, he did recover from illness, and then he returned to his carefree lifestyle following this. After the death of King Henry VIII, Edward inherited the throne, becoming king on the 28th of January 1547, and being coronated on the 20th of February. But following becoming king, Edward was stricken by a mysterious illness that confined him to his bed. Again, those who were close to the king did not expect him to survive, and the doctors even decided he was a lost cause. This news was incredibly secret, but Edward, within a few weeks, had once again recovered, and it was noted he took part in hunts shortly after. But in the spring of 1552, the doctors became concerned yet again, as Edward was sick with smallpox. This was a very deadly disease that was common within Tudor England, and his father and sister, Elizabeth, caught it during their lives but managed to survive. For Edward, though, his fight against smallpox was short-lived, and he recovered rather quickly. When he met with an Italian astrologer in October 1552, it was said how the king was very short-sighted, and also a little deaf, and to read the boy did wear glasses. He was known to have been given eye drops in the form of some mixture also for his eyes. But in December 1552, this is where things went very downhill for King Edward VI. Edward began to show signs he was suffering from tuberculosis, and it's believed that a bout of measles could also have left him immunosuppressed, and allowed him to become infected with TB. Tuberculosis, known as consumption, was a horrific illness that claimed the lives of many, and it did not discriminate. On the 16th of February 1553, 
Edward became very sick with a cold that caused a fever. During this time, Princess Mary, his eldest half-sister, came to visit him to reconcile their differences, but Edward was stuck in bed with a horrific cough. There were rumours in the king's household that he could have been poisoned, and there was a lot of secrecy about Edward's illness. A number of people were summoned to visit the king to try and help him, and one woman whose identity was not known said she could cure him, but she did no such thing. She administered a number of potions and ointments that soon made Edward worse and caused his arms and legs to swell. Edward was not looking very well at all, and as March came he remained ill. For around a month he had not left his bedroom, and it was said that to move the king was very dangerous. But he did seem to recover slightly in April, where he enjoyed a number of walks inside of Westminster Park on days where the weather was good, and then he was moved on April 11th, 1553, to Greenwich Palace to escape the dirty air of central London. He was seen inside the gardens by members of the public the following day, but by this time he was getting worse. His cough was still prominent, and he was coughing up horrific smelling and different coloured liquid. Sometimes it was green or yellow, but in other times it was a colour of blood, showing that Edward's lungs were in great trouble. By May 1553, it was believed that the air would help the king, and the doctors at this time believed he would make a full recovery, but the doctors believed he was suffering from a tumour in his lung. His stomach also swelled, and he began to get bed sores from being in bed for a lot of time. When he met with the French ambassadors on the 17th of May, it was said that the king looked weak, and he coughed throughout the meeting. But by the end of May, he was going rapidly downhill, and was given medication to help him sleep. Edward did make arrangements for his succession. He would disinherit his two half-sisters, and name his cousin Lady Jane Grey, and her heirs as successors to the throne, to avoid Princess Mary becoming queen, and restoring England to Catholicism. On the 10th of June, the situation looked bleak, and Edward was given three days to live by his doctors as it was stated that he could not keep anything in his stomach. He was afflicted with a fever that would not break, and on the 15th of June this in particular was very bad. It did go away briefly for 24 hours, but came back two days later, and Edward's body was so weak it could not fight the infection or disease. He could not get up, and his legs were incredibly swollen. It was said by the 29th of June Edward had had enough, and five days later he could not breathe well, and did not wake up much. It was also said his hair and nails were falling out, and he was covered in scabs. The last few days of the young boy King were incredibly painful, and he was simply just waiting for his death. On the 1st of July 1553, he did appear at windows in the palace to stop people spreading rumours that he'd already died, but he was dishevelled and looked a shadow of his former self. Over the next few days, more crowds would gather to catch a glimpse of the King, but he did not come out. It was Sir Henry Sidney who remained with King Edward in his final moments. Before Edward could not speak, Sidney told him to pray to God to stop England from returning to Catholicism, and it was noted that he wished his English subjects to die as Protestants. It was said Edward prayed, Lord God deliver me out of this miserable and wretched life, and take me amongst thy chosen, howbeit not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, I commit thy spirit to thee. O Lord, Thou knowest how happy it were for me to be with thee, yet for thy chosen sake, send me of life and health, that I may serve truly thee. O my Lord God, bless thy people, and save thine inheritance. O Lord God, save thy chosen people of England. O my Lord God, defend this realm from papistry, and maintain thy true religion, that I and my people may praise thy holy name for thy Son Jesus Christ's sake. The Bishop of Ely, Thomas Goodrich, then heard Edward's last confession, and on the 6th of July, 1553, and between 8 and 9 in the evening, King Edward VI died in the arms of Sir Henry Sidney. It was said that his last words were, I am faint, Lord have mercy upon me and take my spirit. Following his death, a surgeon opened up the King's chest, and stated that he had died from lung disease, as the lungs had two large ulcers, and these had turned infected. It's believed that tuberculosis was what caused the king's illness, or that the king suffered from a pulmonary infection which affected his lungs. At the time for this there was no treatment, meaning that the infection would have caused damage to the lungs and caused abscesses. This infection would have wreaked havoc in his body, and septicemia would have caused his organs to shut down. With this we don't know for certain what killed King Edward VI, but it's believed to have been mostly TB, and for this we can agree that Edward's death was incredibly painful. 
Following his passing, Lady Jane Grey was summoned and declared Queen. However, nine days later she was deposed by Princess Mary, who became Queen Mary I. Edward was buried inside of Henry VII's Lady Chapel inside of Westminster Abbey on the 8th of August 1553. It was said that the procession was led by a great company of mourners and that the crowds mourned their king greatly. Edward's reign was incredibly short and was not what his father wished for him when he was born, but it did signal a large amount of change in England. However, he was a sickly young man and his death at such a young age must have been horrific for the young boy Tudor King of England. Mary I has gained a notorious reputation as a barbaric queen who ordered the burnings of Protestants. John Fox's book, The Book of Martyrs, documents with graphic imagery the burning of those men and women persecuted during Mary's reign. But at the time, illness and disease was not uncommon during the Tudor period. Throughout the reign of the Tudor monarchs, England was hit by many different epidemics and outbreaks of highly contagious diseases. These outbreaks often swept through England quickly, with tuberculosis, dysentery and influenza regularly causing suffering to the people at the time. There was also often outbreaks of smallpox, with Mary's father Henry VIII suffering from a bout of the dangerous and often fatal disease. During this time, great pestilences and outbreaks was linked often to religion, and it was seen that God was punishing the people for sinning and bad behaviour. Hygiene wasn't in the forefront of everyone's mind, but one thing was expected was that the health of the monarchy and the health care they received would be sufficiently better than those living within everyday Tudor society. Mary I's health during her reign was not great, as she suffered from a number of bouts of illness. Some of them were very serious. We have a better understanding today of illness and disease, but during Mary's life, there are specific events that caused her great stress, which would have reduced her immune system, causing her to become more susceptible to illness. She lived a number of years with a great amount of worry, as at the time her father had tried to wrangle his way out of his marriage with Mary's mother, Queen Catherine of Aragon. Mary and Catherine had been treated rather poorly by the king, in favour of Henry's second wife Anne Boleyn, and Mary found herself shunned. This would have played on her mind, and during her teenage years, she had a significant amount of worry. She was known to have had a loud but deep voice, grey eyes and was short-sighted. She also had red hair and a fair complexion, but in early 1528 she contracted the very illness her father caught, smallpox, which she did manage to get over. She also suffered from pain in her head and stomach, and was known for being unable to eat and keep down food for periods of up to 10 days. So she would not eat for 10 days, and this led to her being treated by the best doctors, and Mary was diagnosed with strangulation of the womb, which caused issues with menstruation, breathing, swelling around her abdomen, and also depression. These issues were linked to her death, but she was also struck with headaches, vomiting, and was prone to fainting. In her teenage years, she also became ill yet again, complaining of stomach pains and a headache, and was treated by Lady Shelton, who gave her medication that was experimental. This made her worse, and even caused an allergic reaction, and those inside of Mary's household believed that Lady Shelton may have even poisoned the princess, which could have led to her execution. The king sent the royal doctor to visit and see Mary, and he said she would recover over time. She went through various bouts of illness and ill health, mostly linked to autumn and spring. Her well-being and health was common knowledge even across Europe, and this was dangerous for Henry VIII's plans for his daughter. He wished for her to marry a European prince or king, to secure a powerful alliance between England and another country. But at the time it was difficult for her to find a suitor, and her health was a stumbling block. In the winter of 1537, Mary was struck down again with illness and was bedbound. The royal doctor was summoned again, and she also had a seriously high fever, which almost killed her. It took her a while to get past this latest bout of ill health, but Henry VIII did have some interest in his daughter's health and life, with the royal doctors being summoned to make sure she was okay. When Henry VIII married his final and sixth wife Catherine Parr on the 12th of July 1543, Mary was invited to join the royal couple on their honeymoon. 
However, she would never make it and she was struck down with illness yet again. She seemed to get a lot of fevers and suffered again with melancholy and depression. During the reign of her younger half-brother, Edward VI, her mental state was constantly strained due to the religious reforms hitting England. The country became further Protestant, and as Mary was a staunch Catholic, this caused her great distress and panic. She could have even been imprisoned at the time, as she was seen as a threat against Edward's reign, being Catholic, and also Henry VIII's eldest child. She was pressured by advisers to stop attending Catholic Mass, and to change her religious beliefs to Protestantism. She wrote to the King's Council, saying, My health is more unstable than that of any creature, and I have all the greater need to rejoice in the testimony of a pure conscience. Despite Mary's health being poor throughout her life, she did encounter a number of issues throughout her life, and once she became Queen, these did not cease. After Edward VI's death, Mary successfully deposed Lady Jane Grey, the nine-day Queen, off the throne, after Parliament switched her allegiance to the Catholic Princess. When she became Queen, she needed to marry someone quickly, and the man chosen was Prince Philip of Spain, who later became King Philip II of Spain, a prominent and powerful Catholic member of the Spanish monarchy. Mary's marriage to Philip was met with opposition inside of England, and many feared the influence of the Spanish prince and king on the English monarchy. But the question then turned to an heir, and who would take the throne after Mary? She even imprisoned her half-sister, Elizabeth, the later queen, to ensure she maintained power. Shortly after her marriage to Philip, at the age of 37 she was allegedly pregnant. Despite the fact she had stopped menstruating, the fact she gained weight and was being sick in the mornings, led to those at court believing she was pregnant, and even the royal doctors believed this. Parliament even took steps to ensure who would become the next monarch if Mary was to die in childbirth, and it was said her husband Philip would become regent and rule England, which was incredibly unpopular. Preparations were made to await the royal baby in April 1555, and false rumours travelled across Europe that she had in fact given birth to a son, but this was not the case. She wasn't pregnant despite showing signs of pregnancy, but later within months the swelling of her abdomen receded, and her stomach swelling went down. This wasn't the news that Mary and her husband wanted, and many considered that the whole pregnancy debacle was very strange. Mary was desperate to become a mother and to secure her own descendants onto the throne, but she believed that her false pregnancy was part of a darker punishment. She believed that due to heresy and Protestantism across the country, and the fact that many were committing religious crimes in England, God had taken her pregnancy away from her and was punishing her. She then fell into a deep depression around her false pregnancy and began to grieve for the child she believed she had lost and her mood deteriorated as her husband Philip left for war. She began to become worried about assassination and rebellion due to her restoration of Catholicism and she struggled with insomnia so much that she looked a lot older than she actually was. In 1557 it was believed that Mary was pregnant yet again and that a royal child would be born in March 1558. But nobody believed the Queen, and despite yet again having a swollen stomach, many thought that the Queen was suffering from dropsy, and rumours about the pregnancy quickly diminished. Mary then made preparations that after her death, her half-sister, Elizabeth, would become Queen of England, and she was not able to provide an heir. She recovered from illness, but in 1558 there was great worry in her country. At the time, England had lost land in France, and there was also a terrible famine, caused by heavy rain, that caused many to starve. There was also a bad bout of influenza that swept throughout the country, which killed thousands at a serious rate. During this epidemic, at the age of 42, Mary I passed away at St James's Palace. In her final weeks, she had become very weak, losing her strength, and she had another serious fever that left her in a bad way. She also suffered with depression and insomnia, and was suffering from dropsy. Because of this, she was moved from Hampton Court Palace to St James's to prepare for her death, and to make the Queen comfortable. Her mood became terrible, and she did have moments where she was rational with her advisers, and at times she seemed to pick up, but it was clear in October 1558 that Mary I would die. Philip II learned of his wife's ill health, and went to visit her on her deathbed, even sending his own doctor, 
to see what he could do to treat her. On the 8th of November 1558, it was drawn up that Elizabeth I would become the Queen after Mary's death. Over the next week or so, Mary drifted in and out of consciousness, and her household deserted her to Elizabeth, for them to try and secure a place in her household. Mary went blind, and suffered, and she prayed for salvation, and for God to look after her. She had one final Catholic Mass at midnight, on the 17th of November 1558, and between 4 and 5 in the morning, she passed away peacefully, with the reign of Mary I coming to an end. After her death, her body lay in state for three weeks, before it was taken to Westminster Abbey to be interred. The believed cause of death for Mary I has seen a number of conditions linked to the Queen. One is that her depression following her pregnancies made her downfall and death come quicker, but also that she suffered from ovarian dropsy. This led to severe abdominal pain and cysts that would swell to a large size, and these swellings would have shown as if Mary looked pregnant. Today this condition would have been treated well, and history would have been very different if medical knowledge and practice was better in the Tudor period. Mary stated that her illness was her old guest, and many believe that the flu outbreak across England also led to her death. Despite Mary I being known as Bloody Mary, she lived a rather tragic life, shunned by her father Henry VIII. Her health throughout her life was not good at all. Today we associate Mary with the burning of Protestants in huge public shows of brutality, and she's seen as a Catholic who was firm in her beliefs, returning England to Catholicism. She died a Queen of England, a woman who was incredibly strong in her religious convictions, and also a woman who suffered a large amount throughout her life with her health and well-being. During the Tudor period, medical knowledge and treatments were not amazing. There was a reliance still on apothecaries, and also medieval remedies such as bleeding and purging. Many blamed serious pestilences and outbreaks of disease on God, as there was a link drawn between ill health and religion, as it was believed the victim had been sinning. During Elizabeth's reign, she was ill a number of times, in particular she suffered from smallpox, which in itself was deadly and painful, which caused the Queen to have scars on her face. These were a great worry to the Queen, as once she recovered, she was concerned about her beauty, and even ordered painters to ensure that the portraits of the Queen were free from the scars. As she aged, her image changed over time, and as she was previously described as eternally youthful, this did change. Portraits were painted to make her look younger, and ambassadors noted how her teeth were very yellow and unequal, many of them are missing, so that one cannot understand her easily when she speaks quickly. Elizabeth reigned for almost 45 years and was a final Tudor monarch, but during her final years her health over time deteriorated and many of her close friends and allies passed away. She began to suffer from bouts of what we would call today depression, and in 1590, one of her closest ladies-in-waiting, Blanche Parry, died. She was the chief gentlewoman of the Queen's Privy Chamber, and the keeper of the Queen's Jewels. Elizabeth had known her since she was just a child, and she was one of her best attendants. Blanche Parry was treated as a baroness, and was given land for her service, and her death hit Elizabeth hard. In 1598, Another one of her closest advisers and friends, Sir William Cecil, passed away. He had been by Elizabeth's side during the tough times, and remained a staunch supporter of her, even since her youth. These deaths hit Elizabeth very hard, and she was devastated after them. She began to become more reclusive, but in her final years she acted still as a figure of power. She had overseen the execution of her former favourite Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, at one time many people believed he could possibly marry the Queen, despite the age gap, but Devereux had been convicted of high treason, and was deemed a traitor for planning a rebellion that would have resulted in Elizabeth I being seized. In January 1603, Elizabeth was noted to have been unwell and in poor mood, and she retired to Richmond Palace, one of her favourite residences. Richmond was chosen as it was where the Queen felt most comfortable, and during her final months, she surrounded herself with her most loyal ladies and attendants. During this time, Elizabeth began to shun food and drink, and she lost a significant degree of weight, 
not eating what she needed to. This led to her ladies becoming very worried about her, and they tried to get doctors to see her, but Elizabeth refused to be seen. Another death of a close lady, Catherine Howard, plunged Elizabeth's depression deeper, as Howard had served her for 45 years, and died very suddenly. It's thought that this was a straw that broke the camel's back with regards to her mental health, and Elizabeth, it was said, loved the Countess well and hath much lamented her death, remaining ever since in a deep melancholy that she must seemingly be overtaken. By February 1603, Elizabeth remained in a deep depression, and she was a shadow of her former self. There was a sharp departure from her days in which she rallied and inspired sailors and soldiers at Tilbury Dock, looking like the goddess Athena when she issued her war cry to defend England against the Spanish Armada. The Queen, who was a sign of virtue and strength at that point, was no longer, and Elizabeth, almost 70, was frail and depressed. She remained being stubborn and refused to rest during her time at court. The Queen's ladies-in-waiting worried so much about her frailty that they put pillows over the floor of her bedchamber in case she fell over and injured herself. Further deaths of Catherine Carey, the Countess of Nottingham, and her close friend, Lady Nollies, hit her hard. In her final days, the Queen was rather upset and became distressed, and in March she fell sick and remained in a settled and unremovable melancholy. She was known to just sit on cushions for hours on end, motionless in deep thought. It's believed that in these episodes, she may have been debating her life and the mistakes she had made, and also what she had done with regards to the executions she had ordered. She may have even been contemplating her deep regret over ordering the execution of her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots, whom it's believed could have succeeded her at one point. The Queen never really wanted to execute Mary, but was convinced to do so by her counsellors, and she regretted it deeply. It was said that the Queen sheds many tears and sighs, maintaining her innocence, that she never gave consent to the death of that Queen. Elizabeth, it's said, began to become visited by ghostly episodes of people she had known, including Mary, and others who had passed away. It was clear, though, that Elizabeth was dying. Coupled with her depressed state of mind and her delirium, her health began to fail. She made the decision to retire to bed in March, and the Archbishop of Canterbury was summoned to come to her bedside and to pray for her soul. He informed the Queen that she would go to heaven, and that she would be looked after. On the 24th of March, 1603, Elizabeth I passed away at Richmond Palace. Her body was then taken to Whitehall, where it was held in state, before her funeral occurred. She made it clear before her death that she did not wish to be disemboweled, but this was not adhered to, as Robert Cecil left it up to the doctors to do so, and the Queen was embalmed, with her body encased in a lead-lined wooden coffin. Every night six ladies watched over the coffin, but during this period it was said that there was a loud crack from the coffin, as her body and head broke open from the various gases released as the corpse rotted. The explosion of her body, it said, was so big that it splintered some of the wood, and it was even said to have been worse if she had not been disemboweled. Elizabeth's funeral took place on the 28th of April, 1603, and she was buried inside of Westminster Abbey. There was a huge number who were involved in the procession, and there were thousands of members of the public who came to witness her body making its final journey. It was said there was such a general sighing, groaning and weeping, as the like had never been seen or known in memory of man. It was clear that the people of her country greatly loved their queen, and she was held in high regard. Elizabeth was a monarch who had seen a huge amount of change in her time, and had aimed to restore normality and calm, following some of the turmoil and turbulence of the previous kings and queens. She tried her best to unite Catholics and Protestants under her religious settlements, but in her final days she became incredibly distressed and depressed, with the loss of some of her closest friends. She lamented her reign and some of the decisions she took, and these stayed with her until her final moments. Elizabeth I is considered today to have been one of the greatest queens in history.
The king was criticised heavily during his reign, but his problems led to the English Civil War. Oliver Cromwell and his new model army spearheaded the parliamentarians' assaults against the king's royalist forces, and with this they shockingly defeated the king. But very few people could have predicted what would have happened in the final moments of his life, as Charles I, in front of a huge crowd in London, was executed on a cold January morning in 1649. Charles I was having a number of issues with Parliament during his reign. They were fierce enemies, and the king believed he had been given a divine right to rule by God, and that no one could challenge him. But Parliament were concerned about a number of policies the king had, and the fact he was spending large amounts of money and making terrible decisions. With this, Parliament quickly seized London, and Charles fled the capital for Hampton Court Palace. But within a few months in mid-1642, Parliament and the king had begun to arm and they both raised armies to fight against each other. Negotiations broke down and Charles raised the royal standard in Nottingham, going to war with Parliament. After a number of battles it was clear that things were going poorly for the King, and Parliament managed to seize Charles I. He was held under house arrest, and did manage to escape Hampton Court at one point, but he was then quickly arrested again, and was held on the Isle of Wight. Charles had no chance of winning the war, and Oliver Cromwell refused any further talks with the King, they regarded as a bloody tyrant, and with this they were acting quickly to secure their own power. Charles I was moved to a number of castles, and was sent to Windsor Castle, where he was indicted for treason, and he was then brought to trial. He was accused of using his own power for his own gain, rather than what was good for his country. It was said that he, for accomplishment of such his designs, and for protecting of himself and his adherents in his and their wicked practices, to the same ends, hath traitorously and maliciously levied war against the present Parliament, and the people therein represented, and that wicked design, wars and evil practices of him, the said Charles Stuart, have been, and are carried on for the advancement of upholding of the personal interest of will, power, and pretended prerogative to himself and his family against the public interest, common rights, liberty, justice and peace of the people of this nation." It was estimated that around 300,000 people and 6% of the population died during the Civil War, and Parliament thought he was guilty of all treasons, murders, burnings, spoils, desolations, damages and mischiefs to the nation, acted and committed in the said wars, or occasion thereby. Charles refused to plead and claimed the trial was illegal and he said, No earthly power can justly call me, who am your king, in question as a delinquent, this day proceeding cannot be warranted by God's laws, for, on the contrary, the authority of obedience unto kings is clearly warranted and strictly commanded in both the Old and New Testament. For the law of this land, I am no less confident that no learned lawyer will affirm that an impeachment can lie against a king. They all going in his name, and one of their maxims is that the king can do no wrong. The higher house is totally excluded, and for the House of Commons, it is too well known that the major part of them are detained or deterred from sitting. The arms I took up were only to defend the fundamental laws of this kingdom against those who have supposed my power have totally changed the ancient government. He was then removed from the court, and then over the next few days was sentenced to death, and 59 commissioners signed Charles I's death warrant, including Cromwell. Charles I did not have long before his death sentence was carried out, and the execution occurred on the 30th of January 1649. The scaffold was built outside the banqueting house in Whitehall, and Charles spent his final days praying. He also burned his personal papers and correspondence, and he was allowed to see his two youngest children, Elizabeth and Henry, for one last time. He told Elizabeth to remain Protestant and stay true, and that Henry should not become king if he is approached to do so by Parliament. He split his jewels between his children, and then had a restless last night. He woke up early on the day of his execution, and began to get dressed at 5am, in all black, in his blue garter sash. He spent a while getting dressed, and gave further instruction as to what should happen, with his final artefacts and possessions. He was given an extra shirt, so the crowd would not see him shiver, on the cold morning, and at 10am he was summoned to go to Whitehall for his execution. He drank a glass of wine and ate some bread at noon, but outside the banqueting house, a huge crowd had gathered outside the platform where Charles's execution would take place. The scaffold was covered in black material 
and the execution block was very low, much lower than a normal block. This was so low that the king would have practically had to lie on the floor for his head to be taken off. At 2pm the king was called to the scaffold and he emerged through the window of the banqueting house and climbed onto the scaffold. One onlooker stated that it was the saddest sight England ever saw. He looked at the crowd and saw a huge barrier of guards which would prevent him from being heard if he made a speech so he spoke to one of his attendants on the scaffold who recorded his final words. Charles said, as for the people, truly I desire their liberty and freedom, as much as whosoever, but I must tell you that their liberty and freedom consists in having of government by those laws by which their lives and their goods may be most their own. It is not for them to have a share in government, that is nothing, sirs, appertaining unto them. A subject and a sovereign are clearly different things, and therefore until that be done, I mean until the people be put into that liberty which I speak of, certainly they will never enjoy themselves. He also said he would go from a corruptible to an incorruptible crown in heaven. He said one final word to an attendant who gave him a silk nightcap to put on so his hair did not trouble the axeman. Charles said remember, before he then laid his neck onto the low block, and then he readied himself. Quickly the executioner then struck, and in one clean blow from the axe, the executioner took his head clean off. The executioner then held up the head of the king to silence, and he did not declare the king as a traitor, and following the execution it's believed there was an audible groan, and that the people who witnessed it were not happy with what happened. The king's head was then dropped into the crowd, and a number of soldiers rushed to it and dipped their handkerchiefs in Charles's blood, and they then cut off his hair. The body was then put into a coffin, and this was covered with black velvet. There are a number of people who are suspected of being the person who executed the king. The most probable candidate for the job was Richard Brandon, who was a common hangman at the time. Giles's execution was done by clearly a man who was very skilled and who had cleanly cut off a number of heads, as he did do a successful job. He also executed other key royalists, but Brandon did refuse that he did this initially, but allegedly confessed to being the executioner of the king on his deathbed. The identity of the executioner and his assistant was kept private, and this was done to protect them, as they believed there would be a significant amount of backlash, and many of the usual axemen inside of the capital refused to do the job of killing the king. Many people in England believed they had killed a martyr, and a man who was sent by God to rule over the country. In Europe, many people reacted negatively to the event, and many claimed that Cromwell was nothing but a regicide, and a usurper who had committed a heinous act in organising the king's execution. The event today is still seen as rather controversial, and many consider Charles I to have been a victim of Cromwell and the effects of the English Civil War, but others consider him to have been an evil monarch who did nothing but act in his own interests. But the execution of King Charles I has to be one of the most shocking and significant events in English history. But one king's death which was very painful was William III, or William of Orange, who came to the throne as the King of England, following the ousting of James II. His ascension to the throne became known as the Glorious Revolution, and shortly after William arrived on English soil, with his wife Mary II, the King stepped down in favour of the Prince of Orange. William was a staunch Protestant, and the fact James II was a Catholic gave him a huge amount of support in England and Britain. But in 1702, William III died, and it was then his sister-in-law and cousin Anne who became the Queen Regnant of England, Scotland and Ireland. He was the only member of the Dutch House of Orange to ever reign over England. The Glorious Revolution, also known as the Bloodless Revolution, resulted in the deposition of King James II and the accession of his daughter Mary II and her husband William III, the Prince of Orange, to become the King and Queen of Britain. James II's overt Catholicism caused chaos across the country and alienated much of his population, and he also changed the rules regarding religion across the country. William of Orange was James's nephew and also his son-in-law, and William was worried at the time about what James was doing to England. There was also concern in the country at the time about the power of France in Europe, and England were not really doing anything about this to challenge it. 
but then a great European coalition had began to form, to stop any aggression, but it did depend upon England. But William had been in touch with leading English politicians for around a year before, and he was being approached to invade England and to oust James II. A group known as the Immortal Seven sent William an invitation, and the intention was there for William to come to England and to invade and oust the current king. William landed at Brixham on the southwestern coast of England on the 5th of November 1688, and his fleet was larger than the Spanish Armada. Support for James dissolved when William arrived with many officers defecting from the English army, and James tried to resist the invasion to begin with, but these attempts were futile, then negotiations were underway. Slowly William advanced to London, collecting support, and James II fled to France, with William III being crowned, alongside his wife Mary II. The revolution had occurred almost without any bloodshed, but there was resistance in Scotland and Ireland. The Jacobites for decades would try to restore James to the throne, and also his heirs, after his death, but William oversaw a number of different military campaigns. But on the 28th of December 1694, Mary II died from smallpox, and this left William to rule alone in the country, with the king greatly mourning his wife. When he was the sole monarch, his popularity did wane and plummet across the country. However, he would rule for around eight years, until William himself got ill and died. It has been attributed for many centuries that the king died from complications emerging from a fall from a horse, but this has been debated. William III, it's believed, suffered from issues regarding his lungs for some time, they may have attributed to his death along with his fall. On the early morning of the 21st of February 1702, whilst riding inside the gardens of Hampton Court Palace, the king fell from his horse after it stumbled upon a molehill, and the king was then thrown violently off his steed. He landed hitting the ground and instantly shattered his collarbone. The fall was so bad that it could have killed him or broken his neck, but he then went straight to the royal doctors where his collarbone was then set instantly by them. However, after his collarbone had been set, William then demanded that he should be taken to Kensington Palace, which was 12 long miles away. He was taken by carriage ride, which was very rough and would have caused further damage to his injury. This must have been painful for William III, and the bone then had to be reset again after he arrived at Kensington. But following this, he then went into the King's Gallery, and he sat down and fell asleep by an open window, watching what was going on. It was a cold February afternoon, and William then awoke, feverish and feeling rather ill, having sat in the draught for some hours, in a lot of pain. Chances are that the adrenaline from his injury was also wearing off, and over the next few days, he continued to get much worse. William III continued to have meetings with his advisers and government, and his favourite remained by his side, when he took a turn for the worst in March. At this point, the king then asked for his old friend, Hans Bentick, who he had fallen out with, and this man arrived before the king had his final moments. The king's last words were, I draw towards my end. But at around eight or nine in the morning, on the 8th of March, 1702, William III died. He was 51 when he had died, but following his death, the king's body was then subjected to a post-mortem, which took place two days after he died. In attendance were the king's favourite doctors and four surgeons, and the post-mortem report said a significant amount of issues happened inside his body. It was said, the thorax or chest we observed, that the right side of the lungs adhered to, the pleura, and the left much more, from which, until separation, then issued forth a quantity of purulent or frothy serum. The upper lobe on the left side of the lung and the part of the pleura next to it were inflamed to a degree of mortification. And this we look upon as the immediate cause of the king's death. From the ventricles of the heart and the greater blood vessels arising out of them were taken several large tough flesh-like substances of kind called polyps. The heart itself was of the smaller size but firm and strong. It was then concluded that the king died from pneumonia, and that his lungs were in a very bad way. 
He had suffered throughout his life with chronic asthma, and William, despite falling off the horse, was terribly ill at this time. It was said of his collarbone injury that upon laying bare the right collarbone, we found it had been broken near the shoulder, and well set. Some extravasted blood was lodged above and below the fracture. So the bone had been set, and it was actually said that this was healing, but it was from pneumonia that the king succumbed to, and not necessarily the riding accident that he did have. It was certainly not ideal for the king, but it would not have been his explicit cause of death. Following his death, the Jacobites toasted to the mole, saying he was a gentleman in the black velvet waistcoat who led William towards his death. But in the years following his wife's death, the king had ruled alone, and he had been the target of a number of assassination attempts, which were unsuccessful. He knew he was despised as he was a foreign ruler, being a Dutchman sitting on the English throne. He felt more secure with other Dutchmen around him, but this made him even more unpopular. He was also accused of much gossip regarding his love life, and there were a number of rumours spread around court about him. But to those outside of his circle of friends, the king was considered cold and rude, but he was a man who took the death of his queen incredibly hard, and William's death had little impact across the country. He was allegedly buried without any ceremony in the middle of the night in Westminster Abbey, but then Queen Anne came onto the throne. George IV was the eldest son of George III, and it was said that when he was at the age of 17, he had become too fond of women and wine, but his father was not the fondest of his heir. The prince in 1784 met Maria Fitzherbert and married her secretly on the 15th of December 1785. However, this marriage was then declared invalid as members of the royal family under the age of 25 were forbidden to marry without the consent of their king. But in order to get Parliament to pay his debts, the prince entered a loveless marriage with his cousin Caroline. But a few weeks after the birth of their only child, the couple separated and Caroline went on to live in Italy. But as mentioned, in November 1810, George III became unfit to rule, then afterwards the prince became the regent under the Regency Act 1811. George kept many of his father's ministers, and this benefited England, as others were prepared to leave the war with France, and to allow Napoleon to become the master of Europe. But Britain would triumph over Napoleon in 1815, but when George IV became king, Caroline returned to claim her right as a Queen Consort. A bill to deprive her of these rights was introduced to the House of Lords, but was never voted on by the Commons. George IV's coronation occurred on the 19th of July 1821, and it was huge and lavish. His crown contained 12,000 diamonds, and 2,000 people attended the coronation banquet. Caroline also showed up, asking to be crowned, but she was refused entry. He was not enamoured by his Prime Ministers, and George was considered an intellectual and also a key fan of the arts. He commissioned the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, which was designed like a Mughal palace, and he also restored much of Windsor Castle. But George had ruled as regent from 1811, and then was just king for around ten years until he died in 1830. His reputation across the country was mixed, as one writer wrote of his death, there never was an individual less regretted by his fellow low creatures than this deceased king, but those who knew him liked him. But throughout his life George had been known for loving food and wine, and he had huge banquets. But this led to him becoming rather large, and he then developed gout. Paintings made of him were much more flattering than what was reality, and Queen Victoria would later say of her uncle that his face was covered with grease. However, his last years were characterised by poor health, including conditions such as rheumatism, dropsy, and the hardening of his arteries. He may have also been suffering from the onset of dementia, but George lived his final years inside the privacy of Windsor Castle, and he was known to have spent days on end in bed, and he also suffered from breathlessness, which left him half asphyxiated. By 1827, George was being carried around up and down the stairs, was wheeled around in a wheelchair, and he became even more reclusive. There were great efforts made to stop people seeing the king in this state being carried to his carriage, 
and he spent the last few years of his life at Windsor. George is believed also became blind in one eye, and he took medication for his bladder pain, and he spent a lot of his time drugged up. He then, by spring of 1830, became very unwell. One witness referred to him as as blind as a beetle, and he was forced to stamp legislation with his signature, and he did not know what he was signing for. His weight at this time was around 20 stone, and the attacks of breathlessness continued, and he was forced to sleep upright in a chair, and the doctor had to drain fluid from his abdomen. But the king did still want to live, and he had a huge appetite. For breakfast it was said he had a pigeon and beef steak pie, three parts of a bottle of Moselle, a glass of dry champagne, two glasses of port and a glass of brandy, followed by medication and sedatives. It was also said that His Majesty's constitution is a gigantic one, and his elasticity, under the most severe pressure, exceeds what I have ever witnessed. George then dictated his will, and in his final months he became very devoted and devoted to his faith, and confessed that he regretted his miserable life, but wanted mercy and death to be shown upon him. He was at this point unable to lie down, and then he caught a cough which caused further problems, but then he said in private that, things are coming to a conclusion, I shall be released about Monday. On the evening of the 25th of June 1830, the king was seriously ill, and he was asleep in a specially fitted chair, and he leaned onto the table in front of him, and rested his forehead on one hand. His physician and doctor had been sent away for the evening, and his close friend, Sir Jonathan Waffen Waller, sat with him holding his hand, as the king wanted constant reassurance. At 1.45am, he awoke and asked for medicine before he fell asleep, and then at 3am, he woke again asking for his night chair. The king felt very faint, and asked for the windows to be opened, and then the doctor was summoned. The king exclaimed, My dear boy, this is death. George closed his eyes and lay back then in his chair. He had passed a very bad bowel movement tinted with blood, and this caused great worry with the doctors. But then at 3.15am, George IV died. An autopsy of King George IV showed that he had died from upper gastrointestinal bleeding, following the rupture of a blood vessel in his stomach, and there was also a large tumour the size of an orange found on his bladder. Also his heart was enlarged, and his valves had hardened and become blocked. He was then buried in St George's Chapel, inside of Windsor Castle, the home he greatly loved. George IV was then succeeded by his brother, William IV. But George IV was a king who drank and ate to excess a huge amount, and he put on a lot of weight throughout his life. Many of his portraits show him standing proudly looking slender, but this was not the case, and he was a king who stepped in a number of times to help his father rule, who was not capable but George suffered throughout his life with his own problems regarding his health, and at the end of his life, he spent the last of his days living reclusely inside Windsor Castle. He is laid to rest today in the royal vaults with many other monarchs, including the recently deceased Elizabeth II. Queen Victoria's final years of her reign were rather turbulent and strained. In 1900 in particular, Victoria had a distressing year, which was filled with a significant amount of upset. Britain had been fighting in the Boer War, and the loss in the war and conflict caused her significant amounts of stress, and her eldest son Edward, who was the heir apparent to the throne, was shot. He had been shot in an assassination attempt in protest over the Second Boer War, and at the time was going through Belgium, when an assassin, just a young boy, fired bullets at him. Victoria's eldest daughter also was sick that year. Vicky, the Dowager Empress of Germany, had been diagnosed with agonising breast cancer, which had already spread around her body, and in particular to her spine. The Queen's daughter's health was a great shock and was very sad for Victoria, but then another son, Alfred the Duke of Edinburgh, also passed away. Victoria regarded him as her favourite son, and Alfred, who was not living the healthiest of lifestyles before, for example smoking heavily and drinking heavily, died from throat cancer. His passing in particular shocked the English Queen and upset her greatly. The English royal family during this time began to become surrounded by important deaths 
as Victoria's much-loved and treasured grandson, Prince Christian, passed away from a fever whilst he was away in South Africa within the British Army. One of the Queen's best friends, Lady Churchill, whom the Queen had known for a very long time, also passed away in her sleep and bed while she was visiting the monarch at Osborne House. These moments all had a huge effect on the Queen, who in her years had experienced very serious bouts of depression. In particular when her husband died, she suffered greatly from this. But towards the end of the 1800s, Victoria was not her normal self. She would not eat as much as she previously did, and lost lots of weight, causing doctors and family to worry a great deal about her. She eventually became wheelchair-bound, and also suffered with her eyesight, and often became very confused. Victoria, who was once head of the British Empire, and who had been queen for over 64 years, was coming to terms with her end, and was beginning to slip away. She noted how, another year has begun, I am feeling so weak and unwell, that I enter upon it sadly, showing that in fact she was down, depressed, and coming to terms with her death. Within three years of the start of 1901, Queen Victoria passed away on the 22nd of January, and the Queen's residence on the Isle of Wight, Osborne House, was placed under a very strict lockdown. Not one person was allowed to leave for a brief period inside of the household, and the phone lines were taken down, and a crowd had gathered outside the entrance gates to the residence. On the small bulletin board outside, a note was placed. It read, Osborne House, January 22nd, 6.45pm. Her Majesty the Queen breathed her last at 6.30pm, surrounded by her children and grandchildren. The news of the Queen's death travelled very quickly, and it took many by surprise. For large amounts of the population, Victoria's reign was all that they knew, as she had reigned for so long. No one really knew how to prepare also for the Queen's state funeral, and how to arrange this. The Queen had been ill for a while, and the public had been constantly told that she was not in fact poorly, and doctors had stated for a long time that she was not dying. But one of her doctors, James Reed, a man who had looked after Victoria's health for 20 years, realised that Victoria was about to pass away. He tried to tell the royals that she was dying, but no one would listen, but he could not convince any of them that this was happening. It's been debated for a long time what actually killed Queen Victoria, and despite suffering with confusion and delirium, she had also been suffering with other conditions. Victoria had been suffering with rheumatism, which affected her legs, and forced the Queen into a wheelchair in her final days, affecting her mobility, meaning that she could not get around as she had previously. Also, her eyesight was poor, and she suffered from cataracts. No doubt this was distressing for the Queen, with her sight deteriorating, but this would not have killed her, just affected her mood, struggling to see things which she previously would have been able to do so. She also complained throughout the month that she was weak and generally felt unwell and sick, but as the month continued, she began to feel worse, and dazed and confused. She did state to her doctors at one point, that I should like to live a little longer, as I have a few things to settle, showing that she had fighting spirit, and that she did not want to succumb to her deteriorating condition. After the 17th of January, it seemed like things went downhill for the long reigning monarch, as she suffered from what could be attributed to being a stroke. Strokes can kill instantly, but with Victoria they occurred in a short amount of time and caused her to suffer a great deal of pain. Following these strokes, the royal family were immediately ordered to come to the Isle of Wight. It was very clear to anyone and the doctors that Victoria was on death's door, and preparations were made for her successor, and for the government to stop as the Queen could not effectively carry out her duties. The royal family gathered around in Victoria's small bedroom, and along with the Bishop of Winchester, they prayed and said their final words to the Queen. Priests sung prayers and hymns by her side, and the Kaiser of Germany was summoned, Victoria's grandson, who was also there by her bedside. The Queen was conscious but could not see, and the deathbed was surrounded by her closest family. Each of them kissed the Queen's hand and said farewell in their own way. Clerics continued to chant and sing, in an attempt to rally the Queen, but this did not happen. It's believed that the strokes the Queen suffered caused Victoria's death, but it's also considered that she had a short and painless illness that took her life. Others believe that Victoria simply died from old age, as she was very frail, and other people consider that she had a cerebral haemorrhage. Victoria had been ill for some time, and her health was only going one way. The Queen looked very thin as she did not eat, and she grew tired and confused more often. It's most probable that a short illness was responsible, coupled with her old age. But Victoria did not die alone. 
She was surrounded by her family, including her successor, her eldest son, and also the Kaiser of Germany, her eldest grandson. Following her death, there was a significant degree of confusion as to how to plan for the Queen's funeral. Victoria had ruled for simply so long that no one had experience in doing this. After her death, Kaiser Wilhelm ordered a death mass to be made, and this was against the wishes of the Queen, who would not have liked this. Also, during the preparations for the funeral, the Duke of York was taken very ill by a dangerous illness, and the royal undertakers then arrived on the Isle of Wight to take Victoria's body back to London. But he forgot to bring a coffin, which caused further delay, and a new coffin was built by a local carpenter, then brought to Osborne House. Victoria's doctor and her dresser prepared her body for her coffin, and they refused to embalm the Queen and threw charcoal on the floor to stop the smell and to absorb any moisture. They also cut her hair and dressed Victoria in a white silk dressing gown with a garter ribbon and a star, putting her wedding veil over her face. Then the new king, the Kaiser and other royal dukes came into the room to lift the body into the coffin. A number of objects were placed inside her coffin. These included one of her husband's dressing gowns, a plaster cast of his hand, a lock of her confidant and close friend John Brown's hair and a picture of him, along with pieces of jewellery. The wedding ring of John Brown's mother was also strangely placed on Victoria's hand. The coffin then made its way to London under a guard of battleships and cruisers crossing the Solent, and it had a huge military procession. The official funeral service took place first, and then a smaller one in the mausoleum that Victoria had built for Albert at Frogmore. As her body was lowered into the vault, Kaiser Wilhelm II and Edward VIII knelt by her coffin. Queen Victoria was one of the longest reigning royals to reign over England, but her final moments were met with pain and sorrow for the woman who was once a symbol of immense power. It was Victoria who was referred to as the Empress, but she grew weak and ill very quickly. However, she did pass away, surrounded very closely by her friends and family and lots of love. Following the abdication of his brother, George VI, who was also known as Bertie, became the reluctant king. He was born with the name Albert, and many across the country believed that he would be physically and psychologically incapable of ruling strongly over the nation, and this gossip did spread across the country. But he would prove his dissenters wrong. His coronation took place on the 12th of May 1937, which was the day that Edward VIII was intended to be crowned, but at the time things in Europe were beginning to look rather dire. Nazism was spreading across Germany, and Hitler had seized control, and to many it seemed obvious that a dictator of Germany would begin a war as he sought to take more land. Initially, the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain would favour a policy of appeasing Hitler, granting him some territorial gain to keep him quiet, but this was unpopular. George VI went on a tour in 1939 of Canada and America, and it was intended that the visit would be an enthusiastic visit bonding the two nations and Britain, and with the likelihood of war coming on the horizon, it was seen as a popular thing. At this time, the king and his queen, Elizabeth, formed a strong friendship with the president of America, Roosevelt. But as the Second World War broke out in September 1939, the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth declared war on Nazi Germany. The king, who suffered with a stammer, would make a number of key radio broadcasts, and this would be seen as a defiant symbol against Hitler and hatred. He refused to flee the country during the conflict and would spend most of his time in Buckingham Palace as well as staying in Windsor Castle in the evening. As the Blitz came to the country, with the German Luftwaffe carrying out bombing raids, the King and Queen almost were hit when two German bombs exploded in a courtyard at Buckingham Palace whilst they were there. The Queen said, I'm glad we've been bombed, it makes me feel like we can look the East End in the face. The royal family were living along with the people, who were suffering, and they lived in line with rationing. George's brother was also killed on active service, but when Winston Churchill became Prime Minister, the pair would form a close personal relationship, and every Tuesday, for four and a half years, the pair would meet for lunch to discuss the war effort in secrecy and honesty. The King would regularly during the conflict visit the soldiers, and would visit bomb sites inside of England paying his respects, and also would be seen near the front line. His visits on ships to sailors and other aspects of the military were seen as a great morale boost for the men. 
In December 1939, he visited the military in France across the English Channel and then went on during the conflict to visit places such as North Africa, Malta, Normandy and southern Italy. His visits were seen as the embodiment of determination and his good nature and positivity was captured in newsreels and shown back home. When the war was won, the huge scenes in London on VE Day were a spectacle which have gone down in history as some of the most joyous. The crowds would shout for their king, crying, we want the king, and the king along with Winston Churchill appeared on the balcony and the crowd went wild. King George would also see much of the dissolution of the British Empire and he would continue to go on different visits around the world. However, it was clear that the Second World War had caused a significant amount of stress which impacted the health of King George VI. He was also a very heavy smoker and because of this developed lung cancer and also the walls of his arteries thickened. The king suffered with a blockage in his arteries in his right leg and because of this had to cancel a tour to Australia and New Zealand and he could have lost his leg but was treated in March 1949. As his health became worse and deteriorated, his daughter Elizabeth, our current queen, began to take on more responsibilities alongside her husband Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. In May 1951, George VI was well enough to attend the Festival of Britain, however weeks later it was announced that the king would need four weeks of rest and relaxation. It was clear that the king was ill, and on the 23rd of September 1951, he had a surgery which removed his left lung as a tumour had been found. He would never fully recover from this operation. The following month his daughter would complete a long tour of Canada, and then at the state opening of Parliament in November 1951, the King's speech was read for him by the Lord Chancellor, Lord Simmons. The traditional Christmas broadcast was spoken by George, but as he was weak, it was recorded in different sections and was then edited together. The final time that King George VI would be seen in public was when he defied the advice of his doctors and family, when he went to London Airport to see off his daughter Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip on their tour to Australia. They would go via Kenya, but this was the last time that she would see her father alive. Six days later inside of Sandringham House in Norfolk at 7.30am on the 6th of February 1952, King George VI was found dead in his bed. In the night he had died from coronary thrombosis and that a blood clot had stopped his heart. Princess Elizabeth was told of her father's death by her husband and she spent an hour alone before she flew back to be with her family and arrived as Queen Elizabeth II. Following George's death, the coffin was laid to rest for two days in St Mary Magdalene's Church at Sandringham and then lay in state at Westminster Hall. His funeral was a huge spectacle that took place at St George's Chapel in Windsor and there was a huge amount of public mourning for their beloved King. Ultimately, it was the stress of war and also the fact that King George VI was a heavy smoker that made his health deteriorate. He died at the age of 56, which was considered very young for a man who had the best health care in the country. He would never recover from his long operation and was plagued with smoking related health problems in the final years of his reign. He was a king beloved by his nation. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching.